people come and worship the new one king. People come and worship the new one king. People come and worship the new one king. God is here among us, let your praises ring. The baby born. The wise men went where the baby. 
you now from Luke chapter 1, uh, verses 39 through 48. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country of Judea. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For God has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. All of the gospel writers are aware that there was scandal surrounding the birth of Jesus. And there's always some reference to it, um, usually pretty small, but acknowledgement that it's there. But obviously, they're interested in helping us understand the miraculous nature of the birth of Jesus. So that's what they focus on. But you can see it. Now, we've gotten so used to the story that in our heads, it takes place, you know, in a very short period of time. And, and to get a feel for the real chronology of it, it's helpful to sort of work your way through both the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke and to see how things fit together. So let me do that for you. We start with the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth. Zachariah is a priest and he's married to this wonderful woman named Elizabeth. They're both described as being incredibly righteous people and law keepers and in the best possible terms, but they have no children. So, of course, it being the first century, she gets blamed for that. It's all her fault. You know what the neighbors are thinking, that poor Zachariah married to that woman who can't even give him a child. Why doesn't he divorce her and marry somebody more suitable? And Elizabeth knew this. I mean, she knew that that was the story that people were saying. That was how folks talked about her behind her back. And so when Zechariah is doing his priestly duty, he's in Jerusalem, and he has the job of going into uh, where the Holy of Holies would have been in the old days, alone to light the incense. He's confronted there by an angel. And like all angel encounters, it begins with the words, don't be afraid. And the angel has to say, don't be afraid, I'm here to bring you good news, as opposed to, I'm here to kill you, or whatever. Angels are scary. So don't be afraid, I'm here to bring you good news. Your prayer has been heard, Elizabeth will get pregnant, you're going to have a son, and he's going to be a prophet, filled with the Holy Spirit, he'll be the forerunner of the Messiah. And Zechariah, who is kind of in shock about the whole thing, um, finds himself being like, really? Because, you know, my wife is kind of old and so am I. And the angel says, okay, well, just so that you know that I'm telling you the truth, you're not going to be able to talk until after the child is born. So sure enough, Zechariah is struck mute and cannot speak until actually the day of uh, John's circumcision. So it's the next nine plus months. Did that make their house more peaceful? You know, no yelling from another room, honey, come here. He had to get up and go to her with the tablet he would write on. I don't know. But their life together included the joy of this pregnancy, but Elizabeth was terrified. I imagine that means that maybe she'd had some miscarriages in the past. She kept it secret until it was no, no use hiding it anymore. I don't think the word had gotten out very far. But we know that when she was five months pregnant, at that time, Luke tells us that an angel of the Lord came and appeared to a virgin in the town of Nazareth. And this virgin is engaged to a man named Joseph. I need to tell you a little bit about that. The Bible doesn't talk about how old these characters are because, you know, I mean, if, if we talk about a young couple getting married, we just kind of picture in our minds what age people are when they typically get married. Well, in the ancient world, uh, a, a, a woman would get married when she was 13. 13. So she would be engaged when she was 12, usually in the first half 
of her 12th year is when the engagement would happen. She would be, that engagement, of course, is arranged by an older male relative, father, uncle, brother, something like that. So it's all arranged. The girl's not really given a lot of choice in the matter. And so uh, Mary is engaged. So we know she's engaged. We know she's a virgin. That kind of sets the time for us because once someone is engaged, they really are very careful. They kind of hide them out and they don't let them get out at unsupervised. They're constantly watched over. This is to make sure that um, there's no question of paternity when the first child comes to the happy couple. So this is, this is the way the ancient world was. So we know then the age of Mary, that she's you know 12 years old when this happens. Um, Luke will later suggest that maybe she hasn't yet turned 13 at the time that she gives birth to Jesus because Luke said, describes her um, at, the, at the story of the birth in Bethlehem. It says, and, and Joseph went to Bethlehem to be registered for the census along with his fiance who was about to give birth. So she couldn't legally marry till she's 13. So that suggests at least that maybe, maybe she's not yet turned 13. So that, that's scary for us. And when I think about that, I have to remind myself that that was the normal time for people back then. There was nothing weird about that. Uh, a 13-year-old getting married, that's perfectly normal. And so I always like to remind myself of a couple of things. One is that... Um, Jerry Lee Lewis uh, married his uh, kissing cousin, you know, uh, that's a cousin, a relative, but somebody who you're allowed to marry, his kissing cousin. He married her when she was 13. Mooney Lynn married Loretta Lynn when she was 13. And I knew a lovely couple, uh, Edna and Elmer, uh, and I know that Edna was 14 when they got married, and yet I did both of their funerals, and they lived well into their 90s. So they were, you know, it, it was a different time. So for us, that feels shocking and bothersome. But in the ancient world, this was perfectly normal. Nobody knows how old Joseph was. Um, there are some things in the text that would suggest that this is Joseph's first marriage that would put him uh, likely at an age of about 15 or 16. Uh, we don't have a lot of conversation about the age that men would normally marry, but we do know, for example, of an Israelite king who marries when he's 15. So it seems that that's a reasonable time frame for a marriage back then. Uh, there is another story that develops later in the, in the development of Christianity, I think it's 2nd or 3rd century, that suggests that Joseph was actually much older, that he was more like a grandfather to, to Mary. And even though they were legally married, he treated her like a granddaughter rather than like a wife. Um, so, I, you know, we don't know. We don't really have any good information on that, in my opinion at least. I generally will picture him as being a teenager, you know, 15 or so. But the story is really about Mary, because Mary, this 12-year-old who's engaged, is greeted by an angel who says, greetings, Mary, don't be afraid. Um, God has chosen you. God has called you blessed. And Mary's very confused by this, and the angel says, you're going to have a child, and that child's going to be uh, a wonder. It's going to be fantastic. And Mary's response, completely understandable, is, um, you know that I'm still a virgin, haven't gotten married yet, we're talking about, like, that will be next year, what do you mean? And the angel says, here's what's going to happen, the power of the Most High is going to overshadow you, and, this is, and that's how you're going to get pregnant, it's going to be a miracle, and that's why this child is going to be called the Son of the Most High God. Now, think about this. If something like that had been said to me when I was a 12-year-old, I would have asked, if it, did it involve matchbox cars? I mean, really? Mary says yes to that. Can you imagine a 12-year-old saying yes to that kind of claim on her life? But she does. And it's an amazing gift that she does this. And the power of the Holy Spirit is upon her. She's... she. Um, she, she's rejoicing in what's happening. It's a beautiful thing until she has to tell her parents. We don't hear about that encounter, but we can infer what that was like from these words in the Gospel of Matthew, which tells the story from Joseph's perspective. It says, there was a man named Joseph who was engaged to a woman named Mary, and before they came together, it was discovered that she was pregnant. And then there's this little parenthetical comment by Matthew, by the Holy Spirit. 
Matthew tells us. And will tell us that again as the story proceeds. But in that moment, it's, it, it was discovered that she was pregnant. And the next thing it tells us about Joseph is this. Joseph, being a decent fellow, sought to quietly put her away instead of publicly shaming her. In other words, he was saving her from being stoned. Now go back to the Gospel according to Luke. It was about that time that Mary arose with haste and went to the hill country of Judah. She rose with haste. They sent her away. They got her out of town as fast as they could. And they sent her, because what do you do with a wayward girl? Number one, you send her off to the relative who's married to pastor. That's it. That's what they do. They send her to Elizabeth, who's a relation of some kind. And Elizabeth is married to a priest. So they're going to straighten out this girl. And I think they probably were thinking to themselves, you know, Elizabeth and Zacharias, they never had any kids, so they could, like, quietly, Mary could give birth, they could pretend it's theirs and adopt this child, and everybody would be happy. Because by this point, still, I don't think Elizabeth had shared the good news with anyone. It was keeping it secret. I want you to think about Mary's situation right now. It starts out with the joy, the incredible joy of this good news that she receives from an angel and the power of God overshadowing her. And the next thing that happens is she's trying to explain to her parents how it's a miracle that she's pregnant. And they're yelling at her and it's turning into a big thing. And then she gets shipped off to be with the relatives. And you know that she's expecting at this point that she's going to walk in the door and she's going to get this. Well, young lady, I know your mother raised you better than this. Right? And instead, how is she greeted? Elizabeth says, how is it that the mother of my Lord comes to visit me? For when I heard your voice, my unborn child leapt in the womb. This is the first time that Mary has felt validated, believed for what she's chosen to do. The first time. Now think about this. She, she, didn't, she was given a choice. The angel appeared to her. She had a choice. She answered that choice. Behold, the bondservant of the Lord, she says. Be it done to me according to your word. She believes and she trusts and she says yes. And nobody believes her until this moment with Elizabeth. And then Mary says a beautiful prayer. It's called the Magnificat. And What's in this prayer is something that I've seen it, obviously, forever, but I noticed it for the first time. Mary says this. She says, Magnify the Lord, O my soul. And she goes on to say these words, All future generations will call me blessed. In other words, she knows that while nobody around her except now Elizabeth believes what she's saying, there will come a day when she'll be vindicated, when people will believe, when they'll know the truth of her story. To me, that's an amazing insight into this, this wonderful 12-year-old. Um, oh, my goodness. Because it means that she's a lot like us. I mean, I don't know about you, but I know that there are those times in my life when I act according to conscience. There's all these things that we think that we're supposed to do and all these different ways we think we're supposed to act. We hear it all the time. And then come those moments when something speaks to us, when we feel that nudge, that inner push, that poke, that prod, that drag, that whatever it is from God, conscience, pulling us to do something that we, we know is right but we don't want to do makes us really uncomfortable because no one else seems to think it's the right thing to do. We know we'll be going against the flow. We'll be standing opposed to the crowd to do it. It's really hard to do that. Conscience, it's the inner voice of God. We have to answer that voice. We have to act according to conscience. And I gotta say that we can't just willy-nilly do whatever we think the inner voice is saying because sometimes it's just our own desires manifesting themselves. We need to 
you know, consult our, our wise counselors and read the scripture and pray and seek the will of God. But when we do that, our due diligence, it's not uncommon to come to a place where what you feel God is calling you to do is not what everyone else is telling you to do. And it's hard to make that choice. It's hard to step out in faith, knowing that when you do, you will be criticized. And so, I don't know, if you're like me, there's a little piece of you going, someday you'll be sorry you judged me. Someday you'll be sorry that you didn't believe me. Uh, someday you'll know I was right. So here's a way in which, you know, that you and I are like Mary in that natural human response. Here's a way we're different. Mary had a lot of certainty about what was going on because the angel spoke to her. She had an encounter, one of those encounters with the divine, which is of overwhelming conviction. We, on the other hand, don't generally have that. No angels show up at my door. For me, that, that voice of conscience is something that is easy to ignore, and, and a lot of times I feel uncertain of. I struggle with what's the right thing to do a lot, and then when I do make that decision, even after I've made it, I don't always have that feeling of peace. I mean, I, I have a pe feeling of peace in that now I've acted according to conscience, but I still have distress because it feels like I'm still under assault and attack and being criticized by all these people who are now unhappy with what I've chosen to do. And in the midst of that is the uncertainty that, you know, you know maybe, maybe it wasn't right. Were they right? I did what I believed was right what I, I became persuaded was right, what my conscience told me was right, but maybe I was wrong. And so how do we resolve that? I mean, how do we move forward with that? How do we keep ourselves from living in paralysis between what we're being called towards and what everyone else is telling us is how things are? That How do we do that? I think of this promise, a promise that Elizabeth says to Mary. She says this. She says, blessed is she who believes. Blessed is she who believes. And I wonder if maybe for me and for you, that same promise may apply. Maybe blessed are we who believe. And it is faith, trusting God, that allows us to move forward even when we're not 100% sure, even when we struggle, even when those other voices are opposing us. To, to make that best choice we can and then to step out and trust that God is at work, that God's purposes are going to be accomplished and that when we're faithful, God will use us as part of the way that happens. Let us pray. It is hard to live in the integrity of my faith, the urging and direction of the inner conscience, the conviction of your Holy Spirit, when the people around me criticize and judge and disapprove. I admit to that longing to be vindicated. Someday you'll see I'm right. Someday you'll regret judging me. And I recognize that maybe I am not so pure and righteous and correct as I imagine. The best I can do is hold on to this hope. Blessed is she who believes. And perhaps, blessed am I also who believes. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Oh, morning sun.
Oh, little town.